Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest today. He was the managing director at Drexel Burnham Lambert. He's the director at Asia Frontier Capital, Asia Frontier Fund, Lambert Capital's Lambert Cambodia Fund, a number of many other investment funds. He has predicted with uncanny ability significant market moves such as the October 1987 crash. He appears on many prominent media outlets. He is the author of the Bloom, Boom, and Doom Report. He is a phenom in the world of finance. He is the legendary Dr. Doom. Without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Mark Faber. Dr. Faber, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Faber, I know you're busy, and I have so many questions to ask you, uh, but I'd like to start out with gold. I mean, 2011... I mean, in just one month, around September 2011, it was down 20%, and now it's down around 30%. My question to you is, as an investor myself, as well as for my listeners, I mean, the fundamentals right now couldn't be more bullish for gold. We have a lot of inflation, a lot of unemployment. We have a weak dollar, weak currencies across the board. Uh, you know, commodity prices you know, have been strong as well during, during, uh, around that period. Why has gold gone down so much, in your opinion? Well, basically, investors must understand that in a money printing environment, as we have, and as we have had now for an extended period of time, not all asset prices rise at the same time to the same extent. So what you get is, say, an Nasdaq bubble between 97 and March 2000, then you get a housing bubble, and then we had a commodities bubble until essentially July 2008, and then commodity prices came off quite sharply, and some haven't recovered at all. And the same applies to gold. Gold went up from $252 in 1999 to over $1,920 in September 2011, and we've been in a correction phase. Uh, this has come as a surprise to many people, but the fact is simply that gold rose very sharply during this period, 1999 to 2011, and within long-term bull markets, you can have sharp corrections, as we had in 1987 in equity prices or in 1994 in bond prices and so forth. So, the decline in gold doesn't surprise me all that much. I think more important is to analyze where will gold in future go to. And my view is that over time, uh, given the economic conditions we're in, given the money printing that will continue and probably will have to be increased, and given the geopolitical uncertainties, I believe that gold will continue to rise. Now, will it go up tomorrow or in three months' time or in six months' time? Who knows? But tendency-wise, I would uh, recommend investors to have at least some exposure to gold. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good analysis. And uh, my, my question is, uh, as far as uh, gold is concerned, like the gold seems to be a more longer-term investment. I mean, there is a disadvantage, of course, you know, versus equities because there is no dividends when it comes to gold investments, whether it's the hard asset or it's an ETF. So, you know, gold versus equities, uh, what should be more, more, of a, more of a prominent, that's more an important investment, or should it be just based on a diversification of the two? Well, statistically, equities uh, have performed better than gold over, say, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, but I'm saying statistically, because 200 years ago, the U.S. market consisted of canal companies, some banks, and then the railroads came up, and most of these companies, all the canal companies went bankrupt, all of them. Most railroads went bankrupt. So in equities, you had to continuously rebalance your portfolio and the great companies of the last 20 years where it was Microsoft it went public in 86 Cisco 
went public, if I recall, well, in 1990 or 1994 and so forth. Google went public in 2003. All these companies, they didn't exist 50 years ago. So the comparison is not that easy to be made. You're talking about apples and oranges. They're not the same. Uh, gold has some value as a store of value. In other words, it, it will always have some value. It will fluctuate, but it will always have some value. If you put all your money into one stock today, maybe that company will be bankrupt in a few years' time. When I started to work in 1970, between 70 and 73, the most popular companies were Polaroid and Kodak. <laughs> and the analysts were saying how many people, how many uh, cameras and how many films people in the world will buy and how many cameras and films the Chinese will eventually buy. They were right, but they didn't buy the cameras from Kodak nor from Polaroid. They bought the electronic cameras and the film industry, the photo film industry essentially went out of business. Yeah, that's all the companies, Kodak and Polaroid went bust. Well, that's, that's a very good point. What you're trying to say is, you know, Hey, stocks have a balance sheet, you know, they have earnings to, to look at, but, you know, gold is just gold. Gold doesn't have a balance sheet, so it's really nothing to worry about as far as gold going out of business. It's not the liability of someone else. Yes. You, oh. you buy gold, you store it uh, physically in your safe or in a bank deposit box or wherever it is, uh, ideally not in the U.S., and uh, it's not the liability of someone else. If you have a deposit with a bank, the bank owes you the money, basically. Mm -hmm. It owes you to pay. If the bank goes bust, where's your money? Yeah, that's a good point. I just have one question about that, though. I mean, as far as companies going bankrupt, uh, isn't there, like, warning signs before that happens? I mean, you know, look what happened with GM and uh, other companies, like you mentioned, Polaroid, Railroads. Uh, so, you know, at least, uh, you know, you could still, you know, you could still get out before. I mean, uh, yes, the warning signs come after the stock is down 90% oh, already. Yeah. Because the <laughs> analysts, they keep on recommending stocks as yeah. they go down. They say, oh, they will, uh, it's a buying opportunity. In the 70s, uh, we had a massacre in uh, the stock announcement so-called nifty 50 shares mm. and the analyst and I was at one of these brokerage firms white well they kept on recommending these stocks they dropped 90 percent they still recommended them so it's not like gold just dropping 30 percent we're talking about a serious drop where it's just too late anyway to get out okay well let's put it this way uh, I'm not advocating people to put all their money into gold. Although I know some people that have all their money in gold and they are very smart people. I'm not going that far. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is if you have a diversified portfolio of real estate, equities, bonds, cash, you should own some gold because it's cash, but it's cash that is not subject to monetary inflation per se. Paper money over time will lose its value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I, that's that's a very good point because that ties into exactly uh, what you said in a very interesting interview. You made a very good point. You said that in the Weimar Republic, you know, if you had your money in bonds and cash, you know, we were in trouble. If you had your money in equities, at least they went down, but they were still around. You, know, you still had your money there. So at least equities is, uh, you know, as far as uh, versus bonds and uh, and cash. It may actually be yes. better. But, but there is no magic formula. There's no magic formula. This year, as an example, long-term treasuries are up more than 11%. Mm -hmm. And the stock market, the Russell 2000 is down as of today 6%. Mm -hmm. And other indices are flat and some stocks are down 30% already and so forth. So there's not... You cannot say this is always better than that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes bonds are very good and sometimes they're very bad. Mm -hmm. In the very long run, in general, bonds don't perform particularly well. 
as mm. well as cash doesn't perform particularly well. You're better off in real estate or in equities. But as I said, you have to occasionally rebalance the portfolio. So diversification is the key. Yeah, so I mean, I have... A... I think so. I mean, you know, some people are not diversified, but most investors have some degree of diversification. Frequently, they do not have the discipline to impose and stay with the diversification. In other words, when the stock market goes up a lot, they suddenly start to buy stocks. Of course, then they buy them at relatively high levels. Yeah. And then they are overweight stocks when they go down. And then anyway, at the bottom, they don't have any reserve. They don't have any cash to buy more shares. Same for real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question about bonds too. I mean, this, this year was a pretty bad year for bonds. Uh, you know, the 10-year yield it went from 1.6 percent to uh, nearly 3 percent, and only about a five-month period. You know, during this period, the markets were not doing well. So the question is: Is there like a real chink in the armor of bonds? I mean, you know, people are always talking about in media that uh, oh, it's the flight to quality, but you know, you, you know, last year was pretty bad. I mean, that dip was like the worst since 1994. So, I mean, what do you see? I, I know that you, you've been bearish about bonds, uh, but do you think that uh, there is a room for bonds in people's portfolios? Well, basically, structurally, long term, with the 10 years yield now at 2.6%, uh, yes, I'm bearish. I think eventually yields will be much higher and much higher. But uh, last fall, in October, November, I wrote several times that I would never have thought that in my life I would buy Treasury notes to 10 years at the yield of 3%, which I did, because my view is that the yields had gone up from 1.43% in July 2012 to over 3%, and that bonds were very oversold and the hated asset and my view was that it's kind of a put on the share market in other words if you expect the share market to drop bonds rally if you expect the economy to weaken bonds rally mm -hmm. and so i bought these bonds now uh, these bonds as i just mentioned this year they have performed well and I'm not sure I would buy them again at this level. In, I still hold them as a substitute for cash because I prefer to own treasury securities than cash deposits with the banks. But I'm not sure I would buy the 10 years now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question about the economy. You know, right here in Brooklyn, for example, uh, they have the industrial part, which is areas like Bushwick and Williamsburg, the northern part. And, and you know, for years, so yeah, yeah. The thing is, they, they were making you know, all kinds of you know, raw materials, textiles. I mean, these warehouses were booming. I mean, it was like an industrial powerhouse. And now, what you see over there, you know, it's a bunch of hipsters and yuppies living there, and artist studios. I mean, is this going to be the future of the U.S. economy? You know, what happened to all the manufacturing? And my question is, see, the way I grew up, you know how I learned how to do things? I watched people. I mean, I learned carpentry. I learned auto mechanics. I learned plumbing, electrical work, welding. I, you know how I learned how to do that? I watched people. The skills that I have now are so valuable to me. And I went to college, too. I got my degree. And I didn't learn anything. So, you know, what's the future uh, for the next generation? I mean, well, they, I mean, you're it? raising oh. a very important question. You, you're making a very good point. And uh, as you know, a lot of college graduates, they can't find a job, partially because they do not have the skill sets that you really need nowadays. You don't need people that have studied social sciences and all kinds of nonsense. You need plumbers. You need workers in factories. Today, a worker in a factory is responsible for machines that maybe cost each piece five million, ten million dollars. You can't send some kind of a Facebook idiot to look after <laughs> such a machine. 
And so we have a society, nobody wants to really do a serious job. It's more fun to work in a bar as a bartender. It's more fun to be a waitress in a restaurant. You earn a lot of tips and you meet plenty of people. But very few people actually really want to do a job in manufacturing. And so it's not only that uh, cheap wages overseas have attracted investment and that manufacturing has moved overseas. It's also that in the U.S. and in Western Europe, frequently manufacturers can't find the people with the necessary skill set. So, so what's going to be the future for the next generation? I mean, because it just seems, you know what it seems, Mark? Like well, I have argued now for a long time, and this uh, is uh, reflected in economic statistics about the real personal incomes and real household incomes. The standard of living of the average family in America has been going down for the last 20 years. I'm not talking about the 0.01% of the population that has been able to ride the asset inflation. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the typical American family. They pay higher food prices, they pay higher energy prices, they pay higher taxes, they pay everything more, more, more when their wages have gone down mm -hmm. or stagnated. So to, to, to answer your question, I really believe there is an arbitrage in the world where the standards of living of Western Europeans and Americans and Japanese will rather decline, and the standards of living of young societies in Asia in particular will rather increase. Yeah, I mean, you see, that that's, that's what concerns me, because if there is a collapse, let's say it's a global collapse, let's face it, if there's a major collapse uh, in the U.S., like the dollar, I mean, it's going to affect just about everyone. So there may be a global collapse with this global economy, but you see, like Asia, they're more prepared to rebuild because they have the factories in place, they have the manufacturers in, in place. I mean, you have, they have their ports, like the port of Shanghai is it's unbelievable. There's so much going on over there. And here, you know, you look at the ports in Manhattan and Red Hook and Brooklyn, it's like a relic of the past. So how are we prepared I mean, we don't have the factories in place to start rebuilding. Any, well, like, like the, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, when people say I'm negative about the U.S. or Western Europe. Uh, there are some sectors of the economy that will do well, but the majority of the sectors will not do particularly well. And we have in the Western world something that we don't have here in Asia, and these are the is colossal unfunded liabilities arising from Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And uh, that will be a huge problem in future, huge. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the interesting thing is... The that, system is basically bankrupt. I mean, if you look at even the way they teach kids in, in schools today, you know, they teach them that the presidents that cause the problems that we have today, like FDR, with all these New Deal programs, and he, 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 really, he really perpetuated what we have today, as far as the unfunded liabilities. I mean, back then, you know how politicians are, once they're not in office anymore, hey, it doesn't affect them. They just do what they have to do to get elected, right? And then they start this, you know, this big boondoggle that, uh, you know, can be paid for in the future. And they're not there anyway, not there anyway, they're just doing it at the time. And, and we constantly give these people praise, you know, we carve their faces on Mount Rushmore. But meanwhile, you know, it's the people like uh, the policies of, of Coolidge and Harding, you know, by, by, by cutting the rate of taxes, which actually gave us enormous prosperity, like in the 20s. But what FDR did, you know, his New Deal programs actually, you know, perpetuated the Great Depression. But we continue to give them praise. That's my point. So if we're teaching kids this. It, 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 teach, it teaches the next generation that this is what we should have. We should have big government. You know, our government knows best, and, and they should set policy. So if we continue this educational process, you know, that, then, then how are we going to change anything in the future? Well, there will be one day in future change when even the most stupid people <laughs> realize that governments are not representing the interest of people 
they're representing their own interest. And so eventually there'll be some kind of a social revolution and we will go back to smaller governments. I don't think it will happen voluntarily, but I believe that we're headed into another huge crisis, economic crisis. Uh, the last time, essentially the financial system went bust and it was bailed out by government. The next station will be when essentially governments will go bust. And uh, at that time, some changes may happen, maybe not. But uh, obviously, we are, we are on a course that will end badly. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you uh, something, uh, you know, about uh, something social, because you mentioned, you mentioned social. Uh, and it's about this country, the way things are, are structured socially. I mean, if, for example, the future of children, you know, the next generation, there are so many divorces in this country. There's uh, the, the, the court systems have become a business of lawyers and judges trying to make money off divorce and off, or, off uh, you know, people's uh, social problems. And uh, it, it just seems to be that there are a lot of, you know, they, they say, oh, there's a lot of commitment phobic men. Well, you know, there's a war. Well, it's not only uh, divorces. Uh, I mean, almost 50% of life births are to unwedded mothers. Yeah, my, my they question. Not, they yeah, don't my, even have a husband. Yeah my, yeah, my question is, is that, you know, in this country, not only they turn this whole family court system into a highly biased system for women, you know, women find a way out and, and, and they can, you know, they, they can get divorced. Most divorces are initiated by women. And, and you have all these men, they say, oh, they're commitment phobic. And, and, uh, and, 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 and the courts are screwed. You know, they, 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 these are political appointees, you know, these judges. And the lawyers are looking to make money because it makes divorces very complex in this country. So, and, 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 then, and, then what they, and then what they do is this country glorifies single mothers. They say, oh, look what heroes they are. Well, what about the kids? You know, they're the ones losing. You know, they, 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 they're growing up in fatherless homes. I mean, well, and so, I mean, what's the, and statistically, it's a problem. You know, the, the children that grow up without fathers, uh, you know, are they going to be as productive? And they're not. And, and that's the problem. So my question to you is a very important question I have for you, Dr. Farber, because I know you grew up in Western, in Western society and you moved to the Far East. Do you see the same thing? Do you see children being raised the same? Do you see all these divorces happening there? In, in general, Asians, uh, in particular Chinese, Koreans, the Japanese, uh, have a similar attitude to education as the Jews. Uh, they really uh, push their children to be well educated. And uh, this is uh, particularly true at the present time, as China is growing rapidly and so forth, and also because China had a one-child policy, so couples don't have many children. So the one child they have, they really want the best. But uh, in general, in Asia, education is highly valued. and. Uh, my children and your children and so forth, they will have to compete in a world where you have essentially more than a billion Indians uh, and you have more than a billion Chinese and so forth. And these people will compete with our children mm -hmm. and they will compete very successfully because they're not as spoiled as our children are. <laughs> they're not growing up in an entitlement society. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, so you know, my question to you is, what what made you move to the Far East uh, from, from a Western culture? Did you well, do? basically, social, social I things? started to work in 1970 on Wall Street, and in '73, the company I worked for at the time called White Weld, they asked me to essentially build up their business in Asia, and so I moved to Asia, and uh, I stayed because I like Asia. I saw the economic potential, and I like the 
we don't have really democracies in Asia, but we have um, a lot of personal freedom. Mm -hmm. And so the lifestyle of Asia suits me fine. Mm -hmm. You see, my, my question really was tying into uh, a, a lot of people actually renouncing their U.S. citizenship. And uh, I was wondering where most of these people are going and uh, why they're renouncing the U.S. citizenship. I was thinking, is it for financial reasons and is it also for cultural reasons? Maybe because of all that's going on with this, you know, with this family court system. We, well, I mean, and, uh, I, just to be to, fair, I just wanted to make one point. There are some people that are renouncing their U.S. citizenship and they move uh, overseas, uh, mostly for uh, tax considerations. But there are still lots of people in the world, they would give everything to go to America. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there is an exodus of people from America and a next train. Now there's an exodus of people from, say, California because of its ho ho horrible government <laughs> and high tax rates and so forth. But in general, many people still want to go to the U.S. I don't quite understand why, but let's say if you have nothing, if you're Indian or Chinese and you have essentially the opportunity to go to the U.S., right away in the U.S. you can earn much more than in your home country. And you have a better chance uh, in terms of uh, social mobility also, the social mobility has also uh, diminished, but nevertheless, say, if you have nothing, you're better off in America. Uh, if you arrive in America than in India, or if you have nothing, you're better off in America as a Chinese than in China. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of people still want to go to the U.S. No, but do you think, you see, the whole point I'm bringing this up about, uh, about uh, the social problems this country has, are men going to Western men going to Asia to take Asian wives because they're more loyal and they don't have all these problems that are going on in this country. You know, the state is well. A lot of people from the U.S. they go to uh, say Costa Rica or Latin American countries because of the proximity, and some go to Asia. Yes. Yeah. You see that? that, 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 that not a huge quantity. Mm. Okay, anyway, last, yeah, I will that, soon have to leave you. Yeah, yeah, okay, lastly, I have one more thing, Mark, very quickly. <laughs> I appreciate it all the time. Yes. Uh, and that I have to get your take on this because I haven't heard you talk about it, and that is Bitcoin. Uh, I, I'm telling you, this is it's a phenomenon that just hit the currency world, uh, the world of barter and means of exchange. I mean, you see that, uh, you know, prominent online merchants are taking it everywhere from prominent online merchants to uh, the local bricks and mortar bar. Uh, in Manhattan. So, I mean, it's a serious cryptocurrency, not like the past. What's your take on it? Well, basically, it's a brilliant invention. And the advantage is, if you own a Bitcoin, basically, whether you are in Thailand or in the US or in Europe, you can then buy goods with the Bitcoin. In other words, you don't have to transfer any money. Say you have a bank account in America. If you want to buy a property in London, you have to transfer the money from America to London to buy the house. With Bitcoins, you can essentially access your uh, coins, I mean your money, in England directly, electronically. Uh, if you have gold, you have to carry it from the U.S. to Britain. Now, in an uncertain world, maybe you will not be allowed to do that in future, or many questions will be asked and so forth. So I can see the merit of Bitcoin. I don't own any, but uh, I believe that there is a future in Bitcoin type of monies. Now, with gold, some people have banks where you can have an account, say, in London, but you can then also withdraw your gold in Singapore or in Australia. So that then has a similar function. Okay. That's a great analysis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was Dr. Mark Farber. Dr. Farber, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. It's my pleasure. Take care. Thank you very much.
for having me. That was the Dr. Mark Faber. You can check out and subscribe to his newsletter at gloomboomdoom.com. Please subscribe to this channel to find out what's coming up next. Feel free to leave comments. Please like up this video, and thank you for tuning in.